Almost four years ago, the Lautenberg Act amended the primary chemicals management law of the USA, TOSCA. In this new era for TOSCA, EPA will conduct risk evaluations on chemical substances selected and industry has to pay the bill. In other words, industry is taken to the cleaners. Together with Alexander Dunn, Assistant Administrator of US EPA's Office of Chemical Safety and Pollution Prevention, and Lynn Bergson, Managing Partner of the Washington-based law firm Bergson & Campbell, we will look into the various processes and steps taken so far. Furthermore, we look to see what's in store. Alex, EPA is in the middle of standing up a major regulatory program because of the Lautenberg update to Tosca. How have things been going? Well, I will tell you, starting a new program from scratch is, is quite an endeavor, but things have been going well. We feel like we're getting our sea legs under us. We spent the first two or three years after enactment, really through 2019, setting up the bones of the program, the regulations, the structure, something like the fees rule that you just referenced. And now we have begun the deep process of looking at each chemical of the first 10, which are reflected in, in your cartoon in the back, the first 10 chemicals, as well as for existing chemicals moving forward on the next 20 that we're going to work on. We are in the thick of this. We also, at the same time, have to remember that we have new chemicals coming in the door, not every day, but regularly, and we want to make sure that we are as efficient on the new chemical side as we are on the existing chemical side. Very good. Looking at the risk from chemicals already on the market is one major component of Tosca. After the first 10 chemicals were selected in 2016, EPA chose another 20 end of last year. Can you remind us why these 10 and 20 were selected? Yes, well, there's something called the 2014 TOSCA Work Plan for Chemicals. It was a document developed under the prior administration of the US EPA in 2014, and it lists about uh, 65 chemicals remaining for us to look at. 50% of the chemicals we choose to work on should come from the work plan. So that's what we're doing. And we're really focusing on those work plan chemicals first because there was some agreement when the list was created, that those were priority chemicals. Okay, so then after the 65 are gone, you add new ones to that list. Right, and it's not in groups of 20. You know, this is sort of like ramping up uh, a conveyor belt. We're, we're loading the chemicals into the system, but as we complete each one, we are always supposed to have a minimum of 20 under review at all times. So we will finish one, replace with another, finish one, replace with another. I don't think we'll be at a time like we are now where we're doing this bulk upload of 20 at one time or 10 at one time. That's a unique feature of starting up the law. Okay, and on that same conveyor belt, you just place the first 20 low priority substances. Yes. Can you tell us what that means? Yes, we did. Well, Tosca gave us the opportunity. We have inventoried how many chemicals are in commerce. That was one of the TOSCA obligations. When, when Congress passed TOSCA in 2016, there was an estimate of about 80,000 chemicals in commerce. One of the first tasks EPA was asked to do was confirm how many chemicals are actively in commerce over the past decade. Fortunately, we've confirmed that it's about half of the number that Congress estimated. It's around 42,000. So we have plenty to do. So after we load up the conveyor belt, we will keep working our way through that Tosca inventory. Very good. Lynn, what are your thoughts on the 20 high and low uh, priority chemicals chosen so far? Well, first here, thank you for allowing me to be here. Always a pleasure. Um, and I'm especially grateful to be seated next to Alexander Dunn, who has done a superb job implementing this program, Alex. Every single rule has been on time and on budget, so no small feat. With regard to the selection of the uh, 20 high, 20 low, I think it's like anything else. It's a new program. EPA has been challenged to implement a new law. With regard to the um, low priority substances, I think one of the biggest challenges that I see, and perhaps you, you agree, Alex, is trying to define what is sufficient information for making a determination that some chemical is a low priority. Um, because that's a new determination. There's very little in the statute regarding how to interpret that standard. And because the agency's identification in final of those low priority substances is final agency action and subject to judicial review, I would expect perhaps um, a complaint or two, um, not because there's anything inherently wrong with what EPA did, but with any new statute, 
defining what is a sufficient level of information for making a determination that a chemical substance is truly low priority and that might be regarded as a surrogate for low toxicity is an important determination. So we'll be interested to see how that plays out. Well, so will we, and, and we were very careful, as I mentioned, with 42,000 chemicals, I would say to my team, surely at the US EPA, we must be able to identify 20 out of 42,000 that pose low risk. And risk is, of course, the toxicity or the hazardousness plus the exposure. But, but as Lynn correctly noted, lower priority chemicals are studied less. So one of the things we are told to do is look at the uh, available scientific evidence. And on many of the low priority chemicals, mm -hmm. after a while, scientists move on to study the more hazardous chemicals, the ones that have greater likelihood of exposure, greater toxicity. So we worked very hard on the dossiers for the 20 lows because as Lynn mentioned, we can be sued over our decision that they are a low priority chemical. We feel really good about the decisions we made and hopefully, if we are, are successful, if there is litigation, we would like to be able to do more low priority chemicals. Tosca envisioned us doing it only one time with 20, but frankly, with 42,000 chemicals, if we could come up with a system to put more in the low priority and then focus more on high, we would like to be able to do that. So we worked really hard on the exercise that it would be defensible. So a good mix in the end then. We would like to have a good mix. I think industry and the public is wanting to see us sort this bin of chemicals in some way so that there's predictability. Okay. If we talk about risk evaluations, we just did the first 10 uh, so far. What are your lessons learned there? Well, I could go first. So our lessons learned have been a few. We have eight of our 10 uh, draft risk evaluations on the street, so to speak, for public evaluation. Uh, we have one uh, more peer review coming up for uh, the eighth chemical, and then we will move to the final two chemicals, which are perk and asbestos, and then we will be we will have essentially completed the public process of evaluating these first 10 chemicals. Lessons learned, uh, volume. We These documents are enormous, and the public has struggled, as have our scientific advisors with, and certainly outside stakeholders, oh, yeah. with looking at the level of information. We, we, some of them span thousands of pages. And so we are going to be looking, as we double our workload going into 20 chemicals, how do we sustain this? And then one more lesson learned, and then I'll let Lynn comment on some of her experiences interfacing with the system, is that we have sent each of the first 10, and we'll send all 10 to our Board of Scientific uh, Advisory Committee on Chemicals, which was created in the new TOSCA. And uh, we have been talking a bit now about how to best use that advisory committee. Re using them as a QAQC body to merely go through and pick apart and challenge our work was very good to start, but we think we could use them more strategically going forward. So we're going to be looking at alternative ways to approach peer review. We guarantee peer review for all the risk evaluations, but we didn't say that everything had to be reviewed by our Scientific Advisory Committee on Chemicals. No, I, th I think Alex's um, concerns largely reflect what we on, in the private sector have been struggling with. The trying to identify a relevant and quality set of information to feed into this systematic review process that the agency has established is a challenging, daunting task. On the whole, I think EPA has done a really good job. Developing these programs um, out of whole cloth within a very um, short time frame is difficult. So it's very much a work in progress. I think stakeholders are wishing to collaborate perhaps more um, effectively in identifying how we can address these issues in a way that elicits a defensible product. Um, but it's been, it's been challenging. Uh, some chemicals have all kinds of information, asbestos for example, there's uh, you know, no dearth of information on that, whereas other chemicals like PV29 right. suffer from a paucity of information. How do you find that balance? Mm -hmm. And how do you present information in a way that is relevant and useful for all stakeholders to review? So we're getting there. I think it's just a, a, a work in progress and that um, as these different risk evaluations emerge, the agency will have more experience. 
stakeholders will be better calibrated to, as to what to expect and will be at a better place. Very good. Were there any unexpected results from the first 10? Well, I would, I would reflect on, for example, PV29 was selected first uh, because it uh, was viewed as largely lower um, toxicity, lower exposures. Uh, there were a um, finite set of manufacturers, and so the team started with that one thinking it would be easy. Unfortunately, we <laughs> learned a lot of lessons. Yep. The fewer number of, um, of producers of, of PV29 meant that much of their data was confidential business information, and TOSCA has very broad, the amended TOSCA has very broad approaches to confidential business information. So we ended up in a bit of a push-pull where the information that we received from the companies on their animal testing that had been done on these chemicals, uh, very, very high quality information, but much of it was blacked out or not available to the public. I really commend the two companies that uh, are the, the, the makers of PV29 because they did work with us and penultimately un-CBI'd many of their studies, which, which was a real right. give. We're not gonna always get that in every situation. And we're also appreciative of the companies because uh, just late last week, we have used for the first time our Tosca Section 4 order authority, which allows us to order companies to undertake testing. So because, uh, and people have been asking, when are we going to use Tosca Section 4? Well, I can tell you, we've, we've just used it. Uh, we did talk with the companies about this. Because PV29 went through scientific review first, we were highly criticized for the lack of available scientific information and also some information on exposure and solubility. So those are the tests that we're asking the companies to undertake or technically ordering them under Tosca Section 4, first use of that new authority. And uh, the companies will produce that information in about four months. That will allow us to complete the risk evaluations and hopefully address the criticisms that we didn't have enough information. But that was the chemical we thought would be easy. Oh, you thought it was easy. Okay, we picked good. it because we thought it would yeah. be easier than something like TCE or carbon tetrachloride. Lynn, uh, talking about PV29, uh, the stakeholders said it's not robust enough at a risk characterization. Uh, what is your view on that? I think that's a fair assessment, um, and I also think that the selection of PV29 and some of the challenges that emerged for the agency and finding that there was a paucity of information and information that did exist was subject to CBI reflects something that is an artifact from the law itself. Lautenberg really um, endorsed the 2014 work plan chemicals. But there was no interim step to kind of validate or re-review the 92 or so total chemicals on the list. Um, so because of the way the statute is written, which endorses the selection of those chemicals, EPA's belief that PV29 might have provided a jump start on the process was not an unreasonable one. So it's another example of live and learn. Mm -hmm. uh, we learned a lot from that experience. Um, it wasn't the easy pick as we all expected, but I think the concern that Alex is keenly aware of is a fair assessment. There was a paucity of information. It probably wasn't the best candidate to go out in front on, uh, but again, it's a learning process. We're learning as we go. The program is better than it was and will continue to improve with each uh, succeeding risk evaluation. And one of the things we're, we're looking forward to on the next 20 is the fact that, you know, Tosca was a hit the ground running type approach. There, there was no startup period. It, it went into effect immediately yep. and we started developing the program immediately. So with the next 20 chemicals, I keep looking at your um, cartoon there, um, we have been able to do a bit more planning. And some of the things we're looking ahead on is how to use our Tosca authorities, such as um, Section 8, which allows us to request from companies available health and safety and exposure information available. Also, t section four, where we can order certain types of testing, but we wanna be really responsible with that authority. Um, we've been uh, challenged to use it aggressively. And I think the example that you'll see with us using it on PV29 shows that when a, when a federal government agency orders any entity to undertake testing that's going to cost them 
um, dollars, we have to be responsible on what that request is. We can't just order blanket, open-ended studies and tests. We also have a commitment in Tosca to reducing animal testing, so we want to balance with that. So I think you'll see at PV29, when we use Section 4 ultimately, it was because we knew what type of information was missing. We're trying to do a better job looking ahead with the 20s to identify those data gaps early and then think about how do we get the information? Could it be provided voluntarily by the companies? Do we need to order it? Do we need some time? Because TOSC is all about meeting those schedules. We have 32 chemicals under review right now, which I think is more than the program's ever had actively uh, it, it, under it, review. With, without question. <laughs> it, it, you are burdened to the max. Another hot issue in that review process are the conditions of use of a chemical. Some stakeholders believe that EPA must evaluate all COUs, uh, while EPA and other stakeholders believe that EPA has the discretion to determine the COU that is intended to evaluate. Um, what are your thoughts on that, Lynn? The definition of conditions of use as set out in Lautenberg is clear. EPA does have discretion to evaluate in the scope of a risk evaluation conditions that it believes to be most relevant for purposes of potential pathways of exposure. Um, I think the Ninth Circuit decision clarified that you can't exclude from the definition of a condition of use any particular use, whether it's a legacy or current use. But EPA clearly has discretion for purposes of the scope of the risk evaluation to exclude certain uses that it believes does not warrant a rise to the occasion of an evaluation. I, I think that part is clear in the statute and the court did not disagree. Mm -hmm. Well, and a good example of that condition of use approach is reflected, I think, in asbestos. So in our asbestos scope document, you'll see a problem formulation. There, we are aware of nine remaining conditions of use of, uh, of asbestos in, in chloralkali production, in a variety in brake pads, oil, oil rigs. There's a variety of other tool, uh, nine uses. We've identified them. The Ninth Circuit case, as, as Lynn mentioned, gave us a, a challenging holding to say that we cannot exclude legacy uses and the disposal associated with that legacy use. So what we have decided to do on asbestos is um, continue to move forward with the nine conditions of use that we have identified, and then we will supplement our work with a supplement that looks back at the legacy uses and disposal. So that would be asbestos used in flooring tile or as pipe wrap or in ceiling tiles. Um, it's quite, an, quite a big endeavor, and we don't want to shortchange the risk evaluation of the ongoing nine uses while we wait to get our arms around essentially a, a, t a monumental task, which is to evaluate legacy use of asbestos. Um, conditions of use also comes up in new chemicals. You know, we've talked all about existing chemicals, but we get asked a lot when a new chemical application comes in if we take at face value what the company tells us they, their condition of use is anticipated to be, and do we look any further? And TOSCA, as you know, requires us to look at reasonably foreseen conditions of use. And EPA does do, and we have described in our working approach document that was just out for public comment, how we do that reasonably foreseen. We do use the word reasonably. It's not any hypothetical. It is meant to be reasonable, and it is bounded. And some people have criticized us for that. But we, we believe it's not fair to um, expect a company or a subsequent user of a chemical to abide by uh, some imaginary scenario. We want right. to be as real as possible. And okay. we, we very much welcome the agency's very disciplined analysis of conditions of use, both for new chemicals and existing chemicals, and the document that Alex just noted, um, I think is an excellent, it is really, really an excellent document for new chemical innovators to take a look at it and understand exactly how EPA interprets what might be considered a reasonably foreseen condition of use. That hasn't always been clear, but one of the things, Alex, I think you have done very well is trying to make much more transparent the practices and procedures, both in new chemicals and existing chemicals, to provide a roadmap 
for chemical innovators to understand and rely upon when they go forward and try to innovate a new chemical. It's very helpful. Tosca also states that for certain COUs uh, for a chemical, if they present an unreasonable risk, uh, they will move immediately into risk uh, management. Uh, what kind of measures are taken? Yeah, so that's uh, a very interesting question. So with these first risk evaluations that we're doing, as you know, we are putting out draft risk evaluations and we are finding draft unreasonable risk. Then we're going to the science panel. We've had a few uh, environmental organizations write to us and ask us to use section seven of TSCA, which says imminent hazard, that EPA should address these, that our draft document is, is so clear that, that these chemicals are risky, that EPA should, should not just move expeditiously to risk management, but actually go even further and, and declare them to present an imminent hazard. Uh, we are in the process of responding to those groups, and I have publicly said that we are, we are not, we are in TSCA Section 6, which is a risk evaluation process. They are draft findings. We are not in Section 7. We're not making imminent risk findings. However, if we do find a condition of use is so intolerable, the type of risk that is presented, we can go directly to risk management. A good example of that is our recent ban of methylene chloride, the first chemical banned under New Tosca using Section 6, methylene chloride as a paint and coating remover for consumer use. That product is no longer available at your uh, neighborhood hardware store. Uh, much to some people's dismay because people like to use it, but it unfortunately had too many consumer fatalities. We are still evaluating it, and we have found in our draft that it poses unreasonable risk in the workplace as well as a paint and coating remover, and that's created some tension because people don't want to wait for risk management. But I do think Tosca mm -hmm. set up a process that requires a bit of waiting while EPA makes thoughtful decisions. Anything to add there? I agree completely with the agency's discipline refusal to conflate a Section 6 standard with a Section 7 standard. I think that would pose very challenging legal issues if you were tempted to do that. Number two, I think you can't take Tosca out of commercial context. And when the agency issues a draft risk evaluation that might identify certain risks, the, the commercial market tends to prick up its ears and take response measures even in advance of a regulatory action that may take months or longer to effectuate. So to the extent that people in the community appreciate the agency's review, issue draft risk evaluations, there's going to be a response to that mm -hmm. well in advance of any final agency action, win, lose, or draw. So, and, and methylene chloride is a perfect example of that. Some uh, retailers and distributors were not stocking that product for commercial, or excuse me, for consumer use, in even in advance. advance, recognizing that the agency had made a preliminary determination that was ultimately found to be final uh, and issued in final, but actions take a long time to effectuate. And when the agency issues a draft evaluation, I, I just want everyone to be mindful of the fact that that foreshadows in many instances a course of conduct that gives the, the market an opportunity to take measures more immediately, even in the absence of final action. So, Very good. In relation to Tosca fees, industry is concerned that it also impacts uh, substances in articles imported. Is that a valid concern? It is a valid concern. When we uh, first wrote the fees rule, again, it was a classic example of building the plane and flying it at the same time. So the fees rule was written very broadly. In fact, we took public comment on whether there should be categorical exclusions, exclusions for articles, exclusions for impurities or byproducts, uh, very, uh, de minimis threshold. And we received comment actually in some cases in favor of some of those culling mechanisms. Uh, penultimately, the agency's final rule went with an all-in approach. We have published the draft lists of entities that we believe are, are um, have reported to us through CDR or TRI, the two different reporting databases that we're using publicly available, that they may be a source of one of the next 20 chemicals. We have heard that uh, for example, if you're an automobile importer, uh, think of how many thousands of chemicals are in that automobile, which is an article. 
And so we are realizing that by not having any exemptions for articles, um, as well as the impurity and byproduct categories, we have some implementation problems here. Um, it was EPA's intent to focus primarily on the chemical manufacturer of the chemical itself and the importer of the chemical itself. That's largely where we plan to go. Our rule does not say that these other entities are out. What we thought would happen is that through natural collaboration, consortia would form and it's $1.35 million that has to be sort of divvied up. And um, I think where we are right now, Tiered, is we are, we are going to extend the comment period on the fees rule. We've been asked by a number of entities, number one, to give them more time because if an automotive importer has to identify several thousand chemicals in the automobile, we have an issue. Um, we also want to work with our lawyers and our enforcement division to see if there are any tools that we can put in place to make the first implementation of the fees rule a bit more manageable. And then, fortunately, under TSCA, we're supposed to look at the fees rule every three years. Right. Well, believe it or not, October October <laughs> is when we have to start looking at the fees rule. So this is another example where we're, we're learning by doing, but we do acknowledge that our, our current rule is, is presenting some implementation problems that we there are not easy ways for agencies to change a final regulation, so we wanted some time to see what we can do to uh, relieve the pressure. Okay, if we talk about chemicals in articles, uh, does TOSCA make a differentiation between uh, intended and unintended release? Well, I think the, the big snafu here is that historically, TOSCA has um, excluded the presence of uh, chemicals that are subject to review in, for example, SNRs from Section 13 TSCA certification requirements. And in fact, when Lautenberg came out in 2016, it imposed a new requirement that the agency, if it chose to regulate chemicals that were in articles and subject to a SNR, to demonstrate there was a reasonable basis to believe that there would be a, a, an exposure from that chemical. So I think there was a little bit of a double whammy here. On, on the good news side, I think EPA did a, was trying to do industry a favor, that to bring in as many people as it could to make the financial hit of the fee as small as possible and more manageable. And that was a, a, a laudable goal. The, the problem is because of the culture of excluding articles from regulation, particularly with respect to imported articles, it caused some intellectual dissonance and for new people being new to the TSCA equation, as Lautenberg has brought in many different value chains for the first time, people have been running around with their hair on fire. And, and uh, I think unreasonably so. I was chatting with your colleague Derek earlier. You know, this will get sorted out. And, and the market has a way of correcting for these types of situations. So EPA has been very honorable in extending the comment period, going out of its way to explain what is and is not intended here, and that every reasonable measure will be made to ensure that the fee for a risk evaluation is borne by those who are most responsible for it, which by and large are going to be the neat manufacturers and importers of the chemical. That's the way it will pan out. And all this other stuff is a lot of background noise. Right. There is worry right now that we want to address to, again, provide some uh, to calm the system, which is that uh, it, we are in a period now where we're asking these many thousands of entities to sort of raise their hand and say that they are, they are in or we've made a mistake. Uh, and companies are concerned that if they don't raise their hand or do raise their hand, that they might be subject to some sort of uh, violation of TSCA, which technically to fail to raise your hand is a violation of TSCA. So again, as, as Lynn, Lynn is being gracious, we, we have ourselves in a, a bit of a regulatory pickle, uh, but we have some tools when these things happen and they've happened in other programs where we have unintended consequences. We are able to work with our attorneys um, and with other parts of the agency to, to sort of uh, bridge our way through an awkward time. And then we certainly will take a, a fresh look at the fees roll when we get right back into it. 
Okay. Uh, besides the 30 chemicals selected by EPA, industry also selected two. Uh, they ask you to initiate a risk evaluation. What can we expect from that? Well, those move at the same pace as the, the other chemicals, so we treat them the same. They are part of the, the group that's traveling through. So as I said, we have 32 chemicals under evaluation right now. That's the first 10, the next 20, plus the two manufacturer requested risk evaluations. Uh, there's nothing special about them. Right. They don't have a different way of being treated or handled or managed by the agency other than uh, we skipped the prioritization process. They sort of got themselves to the front of the line. We have had uh, companies uh, or manufacturers come to us and say, hey, we'd like you to look at our chemical next. Um, can, you, can you put us to the front of the line? And what we've said is the only real way to get to the front of the line is unfortunately to become a manufacturer requested risk evaluation and bear the cost of it. Otherwise, EPA will be working the work plan as we discussed earlier. Do you expect more industry to raise their hand to say we want to be on that line? believe there's a limit of about five that we can have ongoing at any right, one time. So we do have some capacity. We've received another one. I think it was not facially uh, complete. And so we have to uh, go through a phase of, of accepting the request. Uh, so we do have essentially bandwidth in the system, uh, but uh, we're, we're um, very busy as it is. And so we're certainly not um, begging for those to come in, but certainly by law, they are entitled to come in. Mm -hmm. And there are, we're working with a group where it really wants its chemical to be in the front of the line because it believes it doesn't pose unreasonable risk. And to get EPA's confirmation that that is exactly the case for conditions of use is a wonderful market attribute. Not without risk, um, but there are lots of issues that go into that calculus. And with regard to the two um, plasticizers, I know there's one quirky um, idiosyncratic aspect of, of it, recognizing that Consumer Product Safety Commission looked upon these two plasticizers in uh, certain applications marketed to children's uses. And so when one agency has one determination with regard to the risks that a chemical may pose in those uses, and now another sister agency is being asked to review as the producers here have urged EPA to revisit those uses previously looked upon by Consumer Product Safety Commission. It will be an interesting determination whether the agency concurs or comes with a different conclusion and then what effect? How, how do you align those two different federal agency determinations of potential risk with regard to children's exposure to, to DI? NP and DIDP. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. To wrap things up, Alex, can you say what um, is coming up this year for EPA, uh, Tosca related? And Lynn, can you explain and tell us about what this means for industry? Well, so what's coming up is quite a bit. In March, you will see the uh, 20 draft scopes for the next 20 chemicals. So we have to scope out the conditions of use, and that, that will be a, we want to make sure we got those right. Uh, because in June we will issue the, the final scoping documents and the conditions of use reflected in those documents trigger something in Tosca that has not been used before. It wasn't available for the first 10 chemicals, which is the concept of pause preemption. As you know, we have our 50 states and territories here in the United States uh, that often like to regulate chemicals themselves. One of the goals of Tosca was to uh, calm things down when EPA was taking a look at uh, chemical and ask states essentially to pause their activity and their regulation of those chemicals while EPA undertook its work. So um, pretend that one of our next chemicals is used um, as a flame retardant. If EPA does not include its use as a flame retardant in that scope that you see in June, then any state could take regulatory action on that chemical as a flame retardant. So between March and June, I think there'll be an effort to ensure that our scopes are comprehensive because I think most manufacturers would like there to be one place where they have to work on their chemical and that would be with the US EPA and not with US EPA plus six or eight or 20 states, which has happened with some of yeah, these chemicals. Yeah, yeah. You will also see us later this year finishing our work on the PBTs, the persistent bioaccumulative and toxic uh, chemicals. We have uh, five of those that we will finish our risk management. We're going directly to risk management on those. Um, so to your question earlier about where will we see some risk management activity, you'll see some very soon. 
Those are due under the statute in December. We're shooting to get them out a bit earlier. Um, what else will you see from us this year? Well, you'll see us continue to reduce the new chemical backlog, as we call it. Mm -hmm. um, backlog is maybe an internal term, but it's the cases that are taking us more than 90 days to review. As you know, for a new chemical application, EPA is supposed to do the review within 90 days. That is our goal, is to, is to do that review comprehensively and defensively in 90 days. Right now, we have a number of cases that have exceeded the 90 days, and we in fact have approximately 300, 200 and almost 300 cases from 2016 when TSCA was amended to now that are caught up in that they're well over 90 days. We want to reduce that number as much as possible this year. Okay, so that's a very long to-do list for 2020 for EPA. Mm -hmm. Lynn, what does that mean for industry? Well, I think for industry we're largely tracking everything EPA is doing. Um, the final risk evaluations that we are waiting to see on some of the first 10. Oh, I forgot to 10. mention the final risk evaluations. You know, we will be very anxious to see how EPA comes down on certain issues. The bifurcating, for example, of the conditions of use for legacy on asbestos and how that aligns with the final risk evaluation for conditions of use that are reviewed will be an, an interesting determination. We do have some of the chemicals the agency is you know considering in terms of diminishing that backlog and, and Alex you've done a terrific job of really getting a lot of those done um, we will continue to watch EPA's refining conditions of use for purposes of new chemical review and implementation of the points to consider document which I think has been a very big plus um, so all of these issues there, it's a continuation of the last three years as we hit, you know, Lautenberg at four, which will happen in June of 2020. The agency has done a really good job of staying on track, um, building a robust architecture of the new law. Um, I think Alex is exactly right. The pause preemption and how that impacts state in increasingly active state initiatives with respect to chemicals of concern in, in various jurisdictions. So we'll be watching all of those and any forthcoming potential litigation on the low priority uh, substances. We'll be watching for that as well. So I just wanted to add on to what Lynn said about things that we do uh, four years. TSCA is turning four in June, and uh, one thing we do every four years is our chemical data reporting rule, which has impacts for many, many companies. And so that will be this uh, reporting is starting in June, and you should see the final CDR rule very soon. Okay, dear lady, thank you very much for being here today and taking the time to provide us with your unique perspectives on the world of TSCA. It was my honor to get all these valuable insights on TOSCA and see that the processes become more and more tailor-made. Also great to conclude that industry is requesting extra risk evaluations. So instead of risking washing their dirty laundry in public, industry voluntarily accepts to be taken to the clinic.